Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics. Even though we most identify the kung fu movie or martial arts cinema predominantly with Hong Kong or Chinese filmmaking, today we're going to see a movie from Japan. From 1974, it is The Street Fighter. So not to be confused with the popular video game franchise, which I love, or the film adaptation starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, this film is the movie that made Sonny Chiba an international star. And tonight's guest, he is a producer, film historian, and the author of These Fists Break Bricks with co-writer Brady Hendricks. So I'd like to give a warm round of applause to Mr. Chris Pajali. How are you doing tonight, Chris? I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. So the theme of the series, we wanna show samples of martial arts movies, predominantly from the 1970s, just some of the essentials. Of course, we have some Bruce Lee, some Jackie Chan, some Shaw Brothers, but this movie, The Street Fighter, it really stands apart on multiple levels. Yes, yes, it does. Uh, it's uh, it's a karate movie. It's specifically it's uh, Kaiyakushin karate, which is what Sonny Chiba had been studying for um, about around twelve years, I think, when he made this movie. Maybe a little longer uh, uh, with uh, the the originator of Kaiyakushin karate, Masoyama. Uh, was his was his teacher and and then he he did uh right around the time of the street fighter maybe a year later uh he played masoyama in three toei productions mm -hmm. uh karate bullfighter karate bear fighter and karate for life mm -hmm. uh, and then he also uh studied shirinji kenpo and uh, with the originator of of that style um Doshin So, and he played Doshin So in a movie from Toei uh, called The Killing Machine. It was originally, it was Sh Shirinji Kenpo in Japan, but when it played in the U.S. in theaters, it was called The Killing Machine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but karate, uh, really, karate movies predated the Hong Kong uh, Kung Fu movies by a, a couple of decades, at least, Um uh, well, you had you had uh, judo movies first in Japan, uh, most notably one of Akira Kurosawa's first movies was a judo movie, uh, Sanjiro Sagata, and then mm -hmm. he did the sequel to that. Um, so, so there there were a string of judo movies, and then judo versus karate, and the karate movies like in the late fifties and through the sixties, and the, the whole idea of ju uh, judo versus karate. Uh, was really the inspiration for uh, Jimmy Wang Yu to do Chinese Boxer yeah. in 1970. He said, because yeah. he had been watching Japanese movies, he liked Japanese movies a lot. He based One-Armed Swordsman on a, a Japanese folk hero. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also, of one of his movies for the Shaw Brothers, uh, I think it's called um, The Heroic Ones, or the, no, uh, The Heroic Trio, I think was the title of it, Heroic Three, something like that. It was uh, he and uh, Lo Lee and another actor uh, are, are the stars. They're, they're the titular heroic trio. Uh, and But it's a remake of the samurai movie, um, the, uh, the Three Samurai, the Hideo Gosha movie. So he, he, was, he was a big fan of Japanese movies. Um, the Zadoichi movies uh, were, were popular. Mm -hmm. um, so... So he he based the Chinese boxer on those judo versus karate movies. It was just kung fu versus karate. Yeah, was was the idea behind that, and it was really the first or one of the first you know open open handed combat movies or kung fu movies uh, in in uh, in Hong Kong because uh, prior to that it had been uh, mostly swordplay movies. Yeah. Well, you know, that was actually going to be my question was, you know, in Hong Kong in the 60s and 70s, they had their wuxia films, like you said, the swordplay film, these lavish period pieces, which were kind of made either concurrently or in response to uh, what we know as like the samurai film, the Jedi Geki films mm -hmm. in Japan, which that's where, you know, it's they're you know, they're telling these morality plays based on their own cultural heritage their own history but yeah in the 1970s there's definitely a shift at least in hong kong and china towards the hand-to-hand -hand combat film mm -hmm. 
And right. the, the Street Fighter, like you said, Japan already had its heritage of these these judo karate movies going back to way back when. But was the Street Fighter made in a response to the types of films that say Bruce Lee or Golden Harvest were doing at that time? Or do you think it was made independently of that creator? Uh, no, it, it was definitely uh, a, a response to the the popularity of Bruce Lee mm -hmm. um, internationally. Uh, I mean, one of the the first names mentioned in the Street Fighters, Bruce Lee. Yeah, you know, in the opening scene, it's like w within a minute or two they they name drop Bruce Lee, at least in the the English dub, uh, which was done here. It was done in New York. Yeah, the, the, the English dub for Street Fighter, but yeah, it was uh, the the international success uh, of 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 Bruce Lee, um, and also uh, the popularity of uh, the Shaw Brothers and the Golden Heart Harvest movies um, throughout Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because the the Toei uh, the Toei movies really the the main market for Toei were uh, was Japan, and then outside of Japan, they're biggest market was Hawaii oh yeah right yeah. right and, and then their second uh biggest uh market outside of Japan was Los Angeles surprisingly mm -hmm. they had a, a theater they owned in downtown Los Angeles um but uh the uh the the Japanese movies I mean there were there were a few from Toei that had played here mostly on television uh there are only a handful of them so they they weren't they weren't dubbed in Japan the way that the the Hong Kong movies were dubbed in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they would have to get uh, acquired by a U.S. company, and then the dubbing was all done here, usually in New York, because it was mostly uh, New York companies in the '70s, anyway, that were uh, that were acquiring these. You know, New Line okay. Cinema, Cinema Shares, Aquarius. Uh, all the company Silverstein films, they're all based in New York. So the, the dubbing was mostly done by Peter Fernandez and his crew that did uh, Speed Racer mm -hmm. and some of the, the TV shows in the 60s. So you hear a lot of the same voices. Right. I'll, I'll have to listen close, closer to the English dub. It's funny, though, like when you think of all the Hong Kong films, a lot of them, you can tell they were either dubbed in the UK or by British artists, and it's right. English actors trying to do their best American accent or neutral accent, but every mm -hmm. once in a while, it slips out a little bit. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, I think in Drunken Master, I'm pretty sure Jackie Chan has an English accent in that, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Sonny Chiba, it's the film that made him an international sensation. Mm -hmm. What's really fascinating is, unlike the stoic very noble heroes that we're used to that were created by mm -hmm. actors like Bruce Lee, Jimmy Wong Yu, the, you know, even the Venom mob, right? Uh, Terry Suguri, or at least in the American <laughs> dub, he is not a nice guy. Oh, no, not, yeah. not at all. Um, and, you know, over the course of the three movies, uh, you know, by the second movie, they've really uh, made him more appealing. Sure. Or, or they've they've tried to. Uh, but yeah, in the, in the first movie, yeah, he's he's despicable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and he's he's the good guy, <laughs> supposedly. Um, and, you know, and he didn't enjoy doing this movie. He didn't like the character. Um, mm -hmm. he, he didn't really care for the movie. He didn't like the idea of of uh, selling karate as um you know for for violence and for for the fighting and everything uh so that that wasn't uh he he was more interested in doing movies like the the masoyama trilogy or the doshin so yeah yeah you know, or um the, the power of aikido was another one he did where, where they're kind of like their studies in martial arts or historical looks at japanese martial arts uh so the, like the street fighters was not uh N not so appealing to him um but getting back to what you were saying though about the the hong kong um the sister street fighter series was originally supposed to star angela mao oh wow I didn't and, know. and yes yeah and there was some problem with her passport uh that's why the character is written as half japanese half chinese mm -hmm. um and she she couldn't she couldn't make it to Japan to film the movie. So uh, Sonny Chiba at that point introduced 
uh, the idea of using Atsuko Shiomi, who was his protege, uh, one of his students at the in the um, Sunny Chiba Stunt Club, mm -hmm. the, which he had just started in the late sixties, uh, and she was one of his first students. Uh, she's in the Street Fighter. She plays uh, Junjo's sister. Mm. who is, is sold into white slavery uh at one point i don't know how much i should say because uh, sure, i don't yeah. know if this is going to be in the intro sure. um but but then uh, you know the the three uh itsuko shiomi and uh jiro yabuki and uh, uh ishibashi um musashi musashi ishibashi who plays the the elder brother junjo junjo mm -hmm. um the the three of them were all um uh, karate students under Masoyama, or, or rather Ishibashi was, um, uh, Jiro Yabuki is actually Sunny Chiba's brother. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, the, he's, he's the one who, you know, goes out the window, he's in the leather jacket and, and yeah. he has the fight where, where Chiba's eating the apple. Yeah. That's his brother. Uh, sometimes billed as Jiro Chiba, but in this one, I, he's Jiro Yabuki. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, she she started out as his student, one of his first students. And so she was in this, she was in the bodyguard. And and then she did some stunt doubling in some of the Toei girl gang movies. Uh, but Sister Street Fighter was her, her big break. And she she filled in for for Angela Mao in that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't realize that would have been an interesting crossover. Angela Mao in Japan doing yep. a, a Toei martial <laughs> arts film. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any other, uh, I, I don't want to say closing thoughts, but okay. for the audience, who's no, so say this is their first introduction to a Japanese karate film or a, a Sunny Chiba film, what do they have to look forward to in The Street Fighter? <laughs> uh, some really interesting villains uh, in, in this one, um, most notably the Blind Swordsman, uh, played by Bin Amatsu, who who was in like every other Japanese movie at that time, like from a 10 year period, let's say from the mid sixties to the mid seventies, that guy was in everything, always playing a villain. Uh, he's in, he's in a bunch of the Sonny Chibas. He's in, the, he's the villain in sister street fighter and, and karate warriors. And, and back in the sixties, he was always the villain opposite Ken Takakura and all those Ninkyo um, movies, the Yakuza uh, chivalrous yakuza movies mm -hmm. uh, so yeah they they could um they could look look forward to uh interesting villains um really street fighters non-stop fight scenes i mean I, I don't think except for sister street fighter i don't think any of the other karate movies have this much action um certainly not this much gore I mean, it's 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 yeah. a very bloody <laughs> gory movie uh, got an X rating in the United States. Um, so yeah, pre prepare for a lot of graphic violence, uh, nonstop karate action, uh, some really cool music. Um, good, good direction. I mean, Shigeru Ozawa was, uh, was a, a really top notch action director. I think, um, a, a lot of, a lot of the things he did in the sixties, I think are really good, uh, stand up to, uh, to, to the street fighter, uh, definitely. And, uh, and, you know, he did two, two of the three bounty hunter movies with, uh, that trilogy is about to come out on Blu-ray. Um, so yeah, you, you have, you have, uh, really good, really good action. And, and, I, and I have to say it plays really well with an audience. As I, I showed this two years ago with Grady uh, at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And yeah, it, it, it's a really good audience movie. S same, same with Sister Street Fighter, which I've shown a couple of times uh, in the last five years. Uh, they're, they're really good, really good audience films. But, you know, you, you just showed Crippled Masters. That's another one that's great with an audience. Yeah. I ran that I, in 2018 at an Alamo Draft House and. It, it still knocks knocks it out of the park uh, so yeah, yeah you picked some good ones thank yeah. you yeah no we had a great time at that one and i know we're gonna have a great time tonight chris thank you so much for your time if you're, you're in welcome. the audience please stick around after the film so you can hear the rest of our conversation from 1974 sunny chiba is the street fighter
you know, that's that movie's definitely out there. That is not a Bruce Lee movie. No, 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 not at all. Even though uh, when it came out in the U.S., uh, emblazoned on the ad mats uh, was a quote from supposedly from Playboy saying uh, Sonny Chiba is the natural successor to Bruce Lee. Yeah. Uh, they were really trying to, to find the next Bruce Lee at that point uh, here in the States. Um, but as far as that being a, a legitimate quote, I, I, I've looked through a year's worth of Playboys uh, and I've not found a review of the Street Fighter. Um, so they, they probably grabbed that from the critic, like as he or she was leaving the, the screening room and just gave, yeah. gave them a quote to use on the, on the, uh, ad mats. Um, yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something else and it, it's, it's still shocking. Um, and it's just like being a, a big fan of Toei productions mm -hmm. uh it, it's a big kick for me to, to see all these familiar faces uh who had been at the studio for at that point a decade uh playing the same roles I mean it's this is the, these are guys who had been doing those chivalrous yakuza movies uh, you know, the guy who who um gets gets his skull crushed and then he spews blood everywhere I mean yeah. he's he's in a ton of stuff um uh, I think his name is uh, Takuzo Kawatani. Um, yeah, he's he always turns up. He was one of uh, Sonny Chiba's friends, uh, so he's always in in like the, even in the through through the seventies in the Kinji Fukasaku movies, he shows up in the in those uh, Battles Without Honor and Humanity movies. Yeah, um, uh, the guy with the glasses, uh, the villain. Uh, he he was in tons of things. I mentioned Bin Amatsu. Um, always always the bad guy opposite ken takakura or the red peony gambler movies he's the villain in like half of those um so yeah it, it's it's a, a big kick for me um uh, you know the the story behind how how the street fighter came to the u.s i don't know if you if you know that um, uh, well i know a little bit about it but if you want to share that with our audience how did it come to america sure well uh robert shea uh, the founder and president of New Line Cinema, uh, had been at the Cannes Film Festival in 1972 with uh, Werner Herzog. And they were showing um, Even Dwarf Started Small. Mm -hmm. And they were going around different screening rooms and they went into, I think it was a Brazilian movie that was being touted highly. And they just thought it was horrible. They lasted like half an hour. So they left there and they, they heard all this screaming and yelling and applause. <laughs> what, what's going on in there? That sounds like the good one. So they went in and it was one of the Bruce Lee movies. It was either Big Boss or Fist of Fury. I, I, I don't remember which one, but they went in and uh, I think it was, it was actually, it was Fist of Fury because Big Boss, yeah, you, you pretty much have to wait to the end for the for right. the applause and the cheering and everything. So it was Fist of Fury. They went in and like, wow, what is this? And so uh, so Shay put a bid in on it for both movies, and he just didn't have enough uh, to to get the U.S. rights. So you know, fast forward two years, uh, and he he felt like he had missed the boat on the the martial arts craze, uh, you know, from Hong Kong. Um, but at that time, there was some talk about Yakuza movies being really popular in Japan and, you know, possibly um, being becoming popular here in the States because there was a movie, uh, Warner Brothers being produced with Robert Mitchum and, and uh, Ken Takakura called the Yakuza. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and then Godfather 2 was about to come out also. Um, this was 1974. Uh, and, you know, Yakuza movies uh, at that time were, you know, they were they were being uh, advertised as, you know, Japanese gangster movies, even though like the ones from the 60s were kind of closer to samurai films, mm -hmm. you know, or, or Westerns, really, like American Westerns. Um, so he, he contacted Toei with the intention of, of getting a Yakuza picture that he could open. He figured that would be the next craze. And so he sat through a bunch of them and didn't really see anything he was interested in. So as he was leaving, he saw the poster for the Street Fighter, which was at that point, it was called, um, I think it was um, Clash 
Hellfist, I think was the the title, something like that, or mm-hmm. um, Death Fist. Um, he said, "What's that? Who's that guy?" And the rep from Toei said, "Oh, well, that's you know, Shinichi Chiba." And uh, hey, I don't know if you'd be interested in that. That's a karate movie. That's not. He said, "Oh, no, we'll put it on," and he loved it. So he he purchased that and and uh, a handful of other movies from Toei, including uh, a Yakuza picture, which he sold here as Tattooed Hitman mm-hmm. with with Bunta Sugawara. Uh, so I think he got like the first two Street Fighters and Sister Street Fighter, maybe in that in that deal, and Tattooed Hitman it was he got a, a handful of them. Um, and you know, brought it back to the states. He had Jack Shoulder was working for him at the time. He yeah. was editing all of his trailers. Uh, Jack Shoulder later went on to direct The Hidden and Nightmare on Elm Street Two, and, and you know, really, really good director. Uh, and in fact, I talked with Jack Shoulder, and he said that he learned how to direct action by re-editing this the karate movies mm-hmm. and also cutting the trailers for the karate movies for, yeah. for new line cinema. He said, you know, there, there were great movies that new line released, you know, Claude Chabral, Lena Wertmuller, uh, you know, the, these other you know, great, great uh, Werner Herzog. Uh, but then, you know, th- those weren't as exciting to, to cut trailers for. He right. Said, you know, how, how, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you, how do you cut the trailer for the not a gang, you know, or something like that. Uh, but, uh, he, he said he loved he loved the, uh, working on the karate movies because he could have fun and, and you know and with the tattooed hitman he rewrote the whole script uh, and I think he changed a lot of the story to that but anyway he he took he took control of it he edited the trailer he did the opening credit sequence mm-hmm. uh, for, for the Street Fighter um, and then you know they came up with an ad campaign for it they, they changed the title of the Street Fighter they changed Shinichi Chiba to Sunny Chiba. Um, they gave a lot of the actors names like Doris and Gerald. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and at the time, uh, the the X rating was uh, was mostly uh, being applied to in 1974 was being applied to uh, to porn films, really. Right. Uh, yeah. And so so this this got hit with an X rating. What had happened was the previous year, uh, the Supreme Court decisions on um, obscenity uh, gave local jurisdictions the, the right to define what was obscene. Mm-hmm. And so like from one municipality to another, there would be different laws. And so a lot of the distributors who had been making money on like softcore or hardcore films uh we're, we're facing jail time and, and really uh, financial ruin um, potentially uh, in, in dis- continuing to distribute erotic films. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these guys got out of it overnight and switched to violence because, you know, <laughs> violence wasn't going to put them in prison. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For a long time. So you had guys like Terry Levine and Sarah from Carol Alexis and, and, uh, and others and you know Robert Shea had put out some things that kind of flirted with, um, you know, with porn. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the John Waters movies were X-rated. He 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 put those out. Um, so so a lot of these guys switched gears in 1973, 74. Uh, but the problem is that the MPAA there was about a year there where the MPAA didn't cr- really crack down so much on violence, but. Uh, but yeah, but beginning in 74, they started to do that. And, and uh, so the Street Fighter got an, a legitimate X rating because uh, the X rating was never uh, was never trademarked for the MPAA, like all the other ratings were. Mm-hmm. So you could you could just slap an X rating on the movie, you know, it, it, if you wanted to. You, you didn't want to spend the money to submit the movie. You figured it was going to get an X rating anyway. Yeah. Why, why, why pay a thousand dollars or whatever it costs to get the movie rated by the MPAA, just put an X on it and, and send it out there. So, uh, so, but they, they did submit it and it got an X rating. And I think the first screening of the first booking anyway, of the street fighter was in November, early November of 74 in Atlanta at the Lowe's grand theater. Mm-hmm. Lowe's was a big theater chain at the time. It still was even in the late 80s. I worked at a Lowe's theater in Syracuse when I was in high school. 
Uh, but at the time, uh, Lowe's ha- operated these big movie palaces in downtown areas and cities. So Syracuse had a Lowe's theater. Buffalo had a Lowe's theater. So the Street Fighter played at the Lowe's Grand in downtown Atlanta. And the Lowe's chain had a reputation for playing anything. So so they signed right on. I mean, an X-rated karate movie meant nothing to them other than dollar signs. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, why not? I mean, they didn't care. Other chains wouldn't play X-rated movies. So, uh, so the, the original uncut version of the Street Fighter played the Lowe's chain and then independent theaters. And when it came to New York, I think RKO, the RKO chain played uh, played it, or at least one RKO theater in, in Manhattan played it. Uh, but in order to, you know, to increase bookings uh, in other cities or in, in rural areas, play drive-ins where an X rating wasn't going to fly, they cut it uh, in, I think, like March or April of 75, um, New Line cut it for an R. And then that, right around that time, a couple months later, they put out Return of the Street Fighter, which is a lot less violent than even even when it was, you know, when it was new in Japan, it was not as violent as the Street Fighter. Um, that was heavily re-edited, though. There are some scenes like the new line version of Return of the Street Fighter scenes are out of order. And, and you know, it's, it's a very different movie. I think it's missing like 15 minutes. Um Jack Shoulder said that uh, one of one of Robert Shea's rules was that every movie could be improved by losing 15 minutes. That's probably true. Like <laughs> nowadays, I'm inclined to agree with that. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, real quick. So it says we have about eight minutes left. Okay. And so I'm, I'll, let me uh, just to, just to give you a heads up. So yeah, Sonny Chiba is really fascinating to watch in this because He's very distinctive looking. He's got these big expressive eyes, these bushy eyebrows. He almost looks like an anime character come to life, mm-hmm. this film. And I understand you got to meet Sonny Chiba at one point. I did, yes. Uh, in 1996, when the Street Fighter movies and some of the other New Line uh, Japanese movies were issued on VHS. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, here's my copy here. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, there it is. Uh, uh, New Line brought Sonny Chiba around the country to Suncoast video stores mm-hmm. and malls uh, around the U.S. And you know he signed uh, he signed videotapes. Uh, he signed anything. Like uh, I brought I brought my original poster of Street Fighter's Last Revenge mm-hmm. to sign. But when I got there. Uh, the new line rep had set up the table and and uh, had put out all these things. So they had stills, like eight by ten glossies of of Sonny Chiba. Well, it says the Street Fighter, New Line Cinema, and and then they had reproduction posters of the original theatrical poster for the Street Fighter. Mm. Uh, so I, you know, he signed my poster that I brought, and I said, "Oh, can I grab those also?" So he signed a still for me, and he signed a poster also. And I don't have; I have original posters, which you can see in in uh, these fists break bricks. I mean, yeah. most of those posters in that book are from my collection. Oh. Uh, so I, ha- I have original posters for Sister Street Fighter, Street the Return of the Street Fighter, Street Fighter's Last Revenge. I've I've uh, ev- everything but the first movie. Uh, the poster I have hanging up, I have framed is the one that that was a re- it's a reproduction that Sonny signed that day in I think it was August or July of, of 1996 and yeah he was great he loved it uh he loved being there and posing for photos there was a long line uh, and then a friend of mine who was there with me was visiting from LA when he flew home the next week he got to do it all over again in LA at a Suncoast video because uh Chiba who was living in LA at the time yeah uh, yeah he he went to the Sun Coast out in LA and, and or Burbank and and uh, and did did the same thing again, you know, with the stills and everything. Um, yeah, I would just want to mention that poster, that original Street Fighter poster was uh, illustrated by Nick Cardi, a comic book artist uh, who uh, was best known for working on in the '60s Aquaman and Teen Titans. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, it's a really nice poster. It's a very um, dynamic piece of art. I'm a fan of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the sister Street Fighter poster is similar. That was done by um, 
two artists. It was Neil Adams and Dick Giordano. Oh, wow. Yeah, they I'm a big comic fan. So, yeah, of course, yeah. I know Neil yep. Adams and Dick Giordano. Um, so I'm curious, too. Like, obviously, the film is as tonally different as you can get from the video game franchise. But has Capcom ever cited the title? Like, have they ever referenced the movies and said, oh, that's where we got the idea for the name Street Fighter? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if yeah. uh, if that's ever that's ever come up i mean when when did the street fighter game that was like early 90s right well street fighter was late, yeah street, street fighter one was 1987 i believe okay yeah yeah the arcade game okay so that um yeah i suppose i suppose it um suppose it could have been based on street fighter i mean it was well, was, was that well, a japanese game well, yeah, that's what I was wondering too. Because yes, it is a Japanese game, but then so the Street Fighter was that the Ameri that was the American title, right? So in Japan, right. they wouldn't have known it as the Street Fighter, right? Um, probably not. No. Okay, so um, it might be coincidence, or maybe you know, it's it's a good title. It works, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's it's an interesting time capsule, <laughs> you know. And, and I I I really wish I could. I mean, it's it's a it's definitely what I call a time machine movie. Whereas, yeah, if I had a time machine, it's one of the movies I would, I could go back in time. I would go to like an opening night in some city. Like, you know, I would go to Atlanta or I would go to 42nd street. Like when the, like the first day that street fighter opened, that would be like one of my, uh, it's, it's so that's what I call a time machine movie. It's, I mean, there aren't that many of them. Uh, another one is Blind Man, the Tony Anthony Spaghetti Western. I would love that. That would be a great double feature, Street Fighter and Blind Man. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but just, just to jump into uh, um, a time machine and go back and see like what the audience reaction was. Oh, yeah. Like the first time, you know, in 1974, seeing this thing. Um, uh, I, I also I want to give a shout out to... Um, Chico Laurent, who's the African American actor who gets castrated in the movie, um, he he's he, he was lived lived in Japan uh, for years, and you know turns up in a lot of Japanese movies. Um, you can see some of them on the Criterion Channel, mm -hmm. um, the the horror movie Genocide. He's in that. He's in Black Sun. He's in. Um, uh, Gate of Flesh, the Seijin Suzuki movie. He plays the priest in that. Uh, he was a jazz musician uh, playing in, in uh, clubs in Japan, and he was discovered by a Toei. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it was Nakatsu, I believe. Um, someone from, or, or Toho. I think it was Toho, actually, uh, who discovered him and, uh, and used him in something early on. And then he, he did Nakatsu movies, and then he was in you know other, other studio films like Toei. Uh, but yeah, he was from Tucson, Arizona, and had been in the Korean War, and got discharged, and just went to Japan, and you know, uh, did did a lot of movies. He's in a Gamera movie. Uh, oh. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Chico, um, and yeah, if, if you uh, if if you become a Toei fan like I am, you'll recognize a lot of these guys. They show up in everything, Tetsuo Endo, and um, uh, the vil the villainess in this movie, uh, Reiko Ike, she's she's in some of the Kinji Fukasaku movies and some of the pink the Pinky films, uh, like the Girl Boss and, and uh, Sex and Fury. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I uh, yeah I I it's it's still it's a crowd pleaser. So uh, mm -hmm. Chris, I know you're a busy guy. Is there anything you're working on right now you want us to know about? Oh, definitely. Uh, well, uh, these fists break bricks uh, is officially out of print now but the good oh. news is uh it's going to a different publisher and we're going to have a revised and expanded second edition and it might even have a different title i don't know but uh it should be out uh april or may 2025 and we're adding a lot of new graphics uh about 20 20 pages 30 pages i think uh there's going to be i don't know how many thousands of words but we're we're adding a lot of new material both text and uh imagery to right. the book yeah well, correcting some things and uh omissions and so on yeah, and all new material 
Yeah, well, well you're hearing it here first. I, I'm definitely going to need an autograph copy whenever it's ready. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll do appearances for it, um, you know, like we did two years ago for the, the, the first edition. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be, and it's probably, it's going to be a smaller version. So, you know, if you're interested in that coffee table uh, copy and you haven't gotten it yet, uh, you know, run out to the to, uh, Barnes and Noble or order it through Amazon, but, you know, before it, before it uh, becomes more expensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, I'm working uh, on the uh, Bruce Bloitation box set that's coming out from Severin. Uh, to support their documentary, which is great. Uh, I have a little cameo in, in it. Uh, but uh, Enter the Clones of Bruce is the name of the documentary. And the box set's going to have, you know, uh, movies starring you know, all the all the Bruce clones, Dragon Lee, Bruce Lai, Bruce Lay, Bruce Leung, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, it's a lot of fun. I'm doing some commentaries. I'm writing an essay for the booklet. Um, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's something else. Uh, that uh, that I'm working on, a lot, lot of other things. Uh, you'll you'll see my name on uh, quite a few releases uh, this year. I think Ninja Terminator is coming out soon. I, I did a an interview on that about ninja movies, uh, which Sonny Chiba did a few, <laughs> of course, yeah, <laughs> quite a few, yeah, TV shows and so on. All right, well, Chris, uh, there's a lot to look forward to. Once again, thank you so much for your time, and we certainly appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. For you in the audience, I hope you enjoyed the film. Once again, my name is Ryan Bijan. We'll see you next time.